Good morning, River Church. I'm glad that everyone is here today. Pastor Randy and his family are out, so my name is Andre, one of the elders here. I'll be filling in for Randy today, but we are glad that everyone is here today. Hope you're having a great day. <clears throat> Not too long ago, when I was still in high school, our, our school would always do an annual trip, like a senior trip, and it was always to Washington, D.C., and it wasn't that far away because I grew up in Pennsylvania. Um, it was just something they did every year in the fall, just kind of celebrate the senior class. And the teachers and, and chaperones had scheduled different activities and tours for us to see and do while we're in DC. It was just a two-day trip. And on, like, I think the first day that we were there, somehow the teachers had gotten noticed that um, we had scheduled a tour of, like, of the White House. And they said that the president happened to be in town and we were was willing to spend like a few moments just kind of shaking hands, saying hi. And we were all kind of excited about that, you know. So we were staying in a hotel in DC and it was a whole bunch of high school students and just a few teachers and chaperones. And the grown-ups, of course, were not staying in the rooms with the kids. That meant that we were just kind of on our own to kind of watch after ourselves, you know, at night and, and getting up on time. My friends and I were not the type that we're getting up early. We were staying up late and goofing off and doing stuff that, that high schoolers do. And we were supposed to wake up early, but my friends and I overslept. And by the time we realized it, the group had already left and there was one teacher that had to stay behind and wait for us. She was kind of annoyed and disappointed that, you know, she was not going to be a part of this tour and meet the president. And we were kind of disappointed too. And to this day, none of us has ever had another opportunity to meet a U.S. president. I have to confess that this story isn't entirely true. I did go to Washington, D.C. as a high school senior. And I did see the White House. We were outside of it in the mall, and we were looking at it. And we did see the president leave in a helicopter, and that was kind of cool. But we never had an invitation to meet the president, and I didn't mean to deceive you kind of maliciously. It was more to make a point. And the point was that we have an opportunity to meet with someone every day, someone that is more important, more powerful than the president. We can do it any time, any day, without an appointment or an invitation. We can reach out to God at any time, and we can know that God is listening. But we fill our time with other things, and we oversleep. We have good intentions, but we, we just don't get around to it, and, and we miss out because of that. Prayer is a quality or characteristic of the Christian life that goes to say that it's typical for, for Christians to say, for, to, for Christians to pray. The other characteristics that we think about with Christians, like giving, reading the Bible, are also important. They're also a lot easier sometimes than finding time to pray. Yet none is more important than praying. Praying can teach you about your relationship with God. And you'll hear people say that, that they're not always satisfied with their prayers. You might say that, well, I don't pray to God enough. Or I wish my prayer life was more fulfilling, more powerful, more effective. You don't have to raise your hands, but has anyone here ever fallen asleep while praying? Why do you think so many people struggle with prayer? I read somewhere while preparing for this sermon one writer said that Christians never admit that they don't want to spend time with God, but our actions say otherwise. And so why is that? Is it possible to pray the wrong way, even with good intentions? Jesus might say that it is. Am I praying the wrong way? You might wonder sometimes. Not necessarily, but in today's passage, God gives us his model for prayer and how we should pray. And if Jesus said it, I think it's worth listening to. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 6. We'll start in verse 5. It says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, 
close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. The hypocrites that Jesus was talking about in this passage were the Pharisees, the religious leaders that Jesus always called out for thinking they were better than everybody else. But we fall into some of the same habits sometimes. Maybe we don't pray out loud in front of others to impress them. Maybe we don't brag about how often we pray. But maybe we use a lot of fancy words or repeat the same things over and over again. The goal of prayer is not to impress others or God, if that were even possible. Instead, Jesus tells us to find somewhere alone to pray by ourselves. And we see that Jesus even did the same thing. <clears throat> this is another passage where it says, where it talks about Jesus being followed by people. It says, yet the news about him, which refers to Jesus, spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I haven't verified this, but this is one of the few instances, I think, the passage that we, we read before this one, where Jesus is kind of praying out loud. A lot of times Jesus kind of went by himself and he prayed, he prayed privately. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 6 and see what Jesus says specifically about prayer. He's already told us what not to do. Now he says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Those last two verses technically aren't part of the prayer. That's just part of the passage, but good words to hear. So let's start at the beginning. When we look at this prayer, the first thing that Jesus says is our. Which I don't know if anyone ever noticed this, but why do you think Jesus uses words like our and give us and lead us throughout this prayer? Because I thought what he just said is that prayer is something that we do in private, and it's me and God. Couldn't I just say, my Father? Or give me my daily bread, lead me in the, into temptation? But I think it's just a reminder that when I'm praying, I'm not just praying for me, I'm praying for you. And when you're praying for you, you're not just praying for you, you're praying for me and you're praying for each other. And not just for other people at River Church, but we're praying for our city, we're praying for our nation, we're praying for the world. It reminds me that my God is also your God. Your prayer requests are my prayer requests. And as a community of believers, we lift up each other's burdens. I'm praying for your daily bread. We also pray for my daily bread. Looking at the next word, Jesus says, Father, which is a term of endearment. And it's amazing that we get to refer to God that way. Is there anyone greater than God? Is there anyone more powerful? I know we have at least one lawyer here. If you go to court, you have to refer to the judge as your honor. You don't get to kind of get all chummy chummy with the judge. I work at a hospital, and there we have to refer to the physicians as doctor. We wouldn't refer to them as like a first name or hey you or, or, or something like that. <clears throat> By the way, I can't see if there's any doctors here. Do you know the difference between God and a doctor? Anyone? God knows. Yeah, God doesn't think he's a doctor. <laughs> but we get to call God Father. He could have told us to start our prayers with something really formal like our Lord or Jehovah or Alpha and Omega, anything fancy, something that you know, the Bible uses as, as terms for God. Why do you think Jesus tells us to, to use the word Father instead of Lord? I think maybe it's so that we aren't afraid to ask God for things that we need, to take any fear out of 
coming before God in prayer, God isn't trying to make us feel unimportant by making us address in some fancy way. And if you think about it, who could possibly be more important to a father than his own children? This is similar to the passage that Randy preached about in Matthew 7, 9 to 11. It says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good, give good gifts to those who ask him? First of all, let me just say, I think it's great in verse 11 that Jesus kind of calls us out and says, you are all evil. He just keeps it real and says, you guys, he doesn't beat around the bush, he says. And I think that's kind of funny. It's not funny in like a bad sort of disrespectful way. I just think that, you know, Jesus kind of tells you, hey, you know, you guys, you guys are evil, but you know how to give good gifts. Secondly, he says a loving father gives good gifts. So how much more will God, our father, who is not evil, give us good gifts? I'm going to just take it back to the, the prayer. Moving on, it says, Jesus says, hallowed be your name. And this is just a fancy way of telling God that he is holy, which seems like a completely obvious statement. It's like saying that fire is hot and water is wet. And then all of a sudden, why does God, why does Jesus tell us to break out all these formalities? What happened to the Father that we are just praying to? I think there's a reason to that. But just to give an example, it's like, as if one of my kids needed to ask me for money or something, and I just kind of made them, you know, give me a compliment or something. Like if they had to come and say, Dad, you know, have I told you how awesome you are? Can I have like $10 to go to a movie or something like that? I mean, I don't ask that of my kids. And maybe for humans, this is a good strategy. But in this case here, where Jesus tells us to say, hallowed be your name, we're not trying to butter God up. It's to, it's important for us, I think, to think and pray about how God, how great God is, because it reminds us that God is really all powerful and really able to answer our prayers. This is the same God that has always existed. No one has ever created God. God has always been. This is the same God that created the world, that performed all the miracles in the Bible, that raised Jesus from the dead, and knows everything that is going to happen, knows everyone that ever existed. If my kids come to me with a need, or they want something, and they say many nice things about me, that doesn't give me the power to forgive sins like God does. I can't heal people like God does. I can't perform miracles like God does. We're not trying to give God a pep talk. It's more of a pep talk for our faith. When we praise God, when we say, hallowed be your name, it's a reminder for us. It keeps us from getting discouraged so that we don't tell ourselves, why should I pray to God for this or for that? Because maybe I don't think God will answer my prayer. When we praise God, it's to remind ourselves who God really is and that everything is possible for God. When we give God praise, it builds up God, but it also builds our faith. Because why would we pray to God if we didn't believe he had the ability to do what the Bible says he can do? The next phrase says, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. This is what Jesus says our first request should be. We usually want to ask for everything that we want right away when we pray. But Jesus tells us to pray for these things first. And when Jesus was about to be arrested and killed, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. He prayed to God that if it were possible, that God would spare his life. But then he also followed up by saying, not your will, but my, not your will, not my will, but yours be done. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. He put God's will above his own, and he asked us to do the same. Because if you think about it, if God's kingdom were to come, and if God's will were, would be done, wouldn't that solve all of our problems anyway? 
If Jesus returned to earth and established his kingdom on earth, we wouldn't have to worry about sickness, our daily needs, our tragedies. It would take care of all of our needs. And that, I think, is why God says, pray for this first, because this takes care of the other things that you would probably ask for. It's also a reminder that what we ask for may not always be God's will. Once I was praying for a very long time that God would do something, fix a certain problem in a very specific way, and then afterwards I was startled with this thought, what if my way is not God's will? Then what it means is that I don't want his will, I want my own way. And I thought to myself and I said, no, what I want is what God wants. And there's the struggle because am I talking to God like a father or am I just looking at him like a vending machine, like I'm putting in a quarter and I'm telling you what I want and I just want you to dispense it to me. This story is true. I was back in high school and one of my neighbors was involved in a bike accident while he was in college. He didn't die but he suffered a serious brain injury and it was devastating for his family. He was the oldest of four kids and he was very well liked. And I faithfully asked for prayer for him in Bible study every Tuesday night. He never got completely better. He never finished college. He was living at home, but he was a shell of his old self. He needed help just to do just normal stuff like getting dressed. I'm not even sure how much he was able to speak. And it wasn't until several years later after his bike accident that he passed away. He probably would have been in his, his 20s. And I remember his mother writing about his death in their family Christmas letter. And she wrote that while she was incredibly sad, she said it was exactly when God decided he needed to go to heaven. And I'm sure she spent countless hours praying for him, like any mother would do. But sometimes we have to put our will aside for God's will, even if we don't understand. We trust that God can see everything past, present, and future. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You might say that, like, what good could possibly be coming out of your neighbor suffering a bike injury and then dying a few years later? And I don't really know, to be honest. But then I'm, I'm not God. But I know that it's good for me and it's the best thing for me to trust in God for all things and then understand in life that there will be triumphs and there will be tragedies. Not everything will go my way. But in the end, everything will be all right. I'm going to go back to the, the prayer here, our main passage. The next part says, give us this day our daily bread. And this is the part where we finally get into the stuff that we're asking for, the stuff that we want our personal requests. This is also too maybe where we get an idea, like at the very least, at, at the minimum, how often we should pray. Because the first personal request, Jesus tells us we should ask for daily bread. You know, not weekly bread or, or monthly bread or give me a whole year supply of bread because I just want to ask once, you know. I think God doesn't want us to depend on ourselves too much. God wants to be our Father our provider. And if we get too much at one time, then we start to rely on God too little and we start to rely on ourselves too much. Just give me enough to get through today and then tomorrow, tomorrow I'll come back and I'll, I'll ask for some more bread. I think God wants us to be dependent on him, not ourselves. There's another verse back in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy chapter 8. 17 and 18, it says, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors, as it is today. What this means is that we think we are responsible for our daily bread and all the stuff that we have, but we're not. God is, is always the one providing our daily bread. Bart Simpson one time prayed before a meal and he said, Dear God, we prayed for all we paid for all of this stuff ourselves, so thanks for nothing. <laughs> and if we don't give credit and thanks to God for all that we have, we sound just like that. 
the next passage says, forgive us our debts as we forgive those forgiven our debtors. This should be our second request. We've already kind of asked for food and for the stuff that we need for the day. This is also something that needs to be prayed often because if we're honest, there will always be, need thing, there will always be things that we need forgiveness for. And there will always be people that we need to forgive. And this is a reminder that sometimes forgiveness isn't a one-time event. Sometimes when we've been wronged by someone, we have to continually forgive. Maybe every day. And another reason, another reason we need prayer at least daily is to be forgiven by God. If you struggle with, with sin and being forgiven by God or forgiving others, then you might not be praying often enough. In Matthew chapter 18, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Also, looking back at the original passage, Jesus says, if we don't forgive others, then God won't forgive us either. The next request that Jesus tells us we should pray is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This should be our third personal request. We're asking God to help us fight temptation. And I can assure you that if you really want to break patterns of sinful behavior, prayer is the best way to start. Maybe the reason you're struggling is that you're trying to do it all on your own. And God wants us to ask him for help. He knows we can't do it on our own. This Lord, the Lord's Prayer here is about giving us an ideal prayer. For some people, prayer is easy, but for others, myself included, it's easy to get off track. We start focusing too much on ourselves and our own needs. Prayer becomes us simply asking God for things, but really prayer is about strengthening our relationship with God. The Lord's Prayer brings things back into perspective. It gets us back to how our prayers should be should focus more on God and less on ourselves. Because even after we start asking God for our, our personal requests, these personal requests still are about God. We're praying that we would be dependent on God for our daily bread, for our daily needs. It's asking God for forgiveness in order to stay in relationship with Him. And it's asking God to protect us from temptation so that we don't jeopardize our relationship with God. Our tendency is to think that prayer is about us asking God for things, but prayer is really about strengthening our relationship with God. Three things that I want to highlight from the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer teaches us what we should be praying for and in what order. Yes, it does say that God knows what we need before we ask for it. But praying helps us get ourselves right with God. How can we expect to stay close with friends that we never talk to? How can we expect to stay close to God if we never pray? Or if we seldom pray? If we just go you know, on Sundays when we're here in church? Something else to consider is that when we're praying, whose will am I seeking? If my prayers seem like they're not being answered, am I praying for what I want or for what God wants? And if so, which, which one is better for me? Should I keep praying for what I want or should I open it up and say, okay, God, I'm listening now. Tell me what, what you want and we'll go that direction. I think it's also to remind us to be more dependent on God. If things aren't going, for, going well for me in life, am I trying to do too much by myself? How can I give up control of things and let God handle them? I think the first place would be to start praying more. Before we enter the time of communion, I want us all just to say the Lord's Prayer together. You can say it in whatever translation you know you might have learned it in King James. You can say it in another language if you'd like. 
It's going to flash back. You can also just follow along. I grew up reading the, the NIV, so I tend to go back to that one. But I did have to learn it at one time in, in King James. I missed it. Okay, there we go. We'll just go all the way through verse 14. We won't say the last part. And we'll start at the second half of verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you kingdom in the power. I know this is a different version. This is the passage I have. But we can all say it together. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.